Good evening. Wednesday night Bible story time. That's what I used to call it with the kids at Oak Hill. Bible story time. Because if you really want to study the Bible, it's best if you understand that you have a story. I want to mention a couple things before we get started that are of significant importance. For those of you who have the courage to pray for someone who's sick, and I'm not being sarcastic, it's the hardest thing in the world to do. When we're saying our prayers, especially when I was learning to say prayers for other people as a pastor, I'd pray for the children and families and jobs and, you know, the, the elderly and just the stuff that's easy. But then you get to the people who are sick and you want to just quietly and gently just walk past that with, without too much stir because, well, after all, we're postmodern Christians and surely we, God doesn't listen to our prayers, really. And surely God's not able to heal anymore. And we know in our heart that that's not true. But we're still afraid sometimes to pray for the sick. One of, my, one of my good friends asked me to pray for Terry Woodruff, who's fighting an aggressive cancer. And I learned in my first church, when we had this big tent revival out in the yard, and everybody thought we'd gone crazy, that we had a guest preacher show up uh, because we had people in the congregation. I said, if you want a preacher you like, that you want to come, have him come and preach. And it was pretty powerful revival that tent meeting and this preacher was not a Methodist he was a what we call advanced Methodist he's a holiness you know they came out of the Methodist church and and he preached a mighty good sermon and I was ready to sing the closing hymn and go home and uh, he said now before we uh, pray is there anybody here that uh, has a need for prayer that would like to come forward? And one or two people came up, and they were praying for their job, and he prayed for that, and they were praying for uh, their sister, and he prayed for that. And this little old woman came up, and she said, I have diabetes. And he tore into praying as if he was the number one enemy of diabetes. Well, you can't fix diabetes. You can't heal leprosy. You can't make blind people see. You can't make lame people walk. But he knew someone who could. And that's how he prayed. Now that doesn't mean that I've learned to be the most courageous prayer warrior in the world. I'm not. Uh, especially when some little girl comes up to you at the closing hymn at your church and says, my daddy doesn't come to church and he has cancer. She says, I want us to pray for him. And I said, well, certainly. While they were singing the closing hymn, I knelt down there at the altar, and she knelt down beside me. She says, you have to wait for him. I brought him to church with me today. And I thought, what have I gotten myself into? And so she went and got her daddy. And he was a sick man. And I'm a timid little Methodist preacher, and I don't want the DS to get on me because you know how scared I am of district superintendents. And and if you don't ask them, it's a joke. <coughs> we were stuck. And you know, you can't do that, that little yuppie prayer, you know, if you're in some high-dollar church somewhere with, you know, and say... Well, Lord, we just thank you for the birds and the trees and the leaves, and, and we just, that doesn't work. No, you have to pray. Now, I, did, I didn't profess to be the most courageous prayer warrior, and I, I profess that I am not. But I remember going to God that day with a humble heart on behalf of not only this man fighting cancer, but on behalf of the little girl who loved him. I'm not a faith healer because that's a gift, but I do know someone who is. His name is Jesus. And so we began to pray. 
And as we began to pray, people in the congregation came up and they began to pray with us. And pretty soon, people were praying alongside me, out loud. And all of a sudden, we'd lost touch with any kind of sophistication we might have thought we had and replaced it with supplication. That man is still alive today, not because we were good at praying, <clears throat> not because we deserved it, or we were somehow, uh, I promise me, that's the second meanest church I ever served in my life down there in that part of the country, and, 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 and they were tough, and, and we had our differences because we had a million differences, and so we had to search hard while I was pastor and they were the congregation for the things we had in common, and that was Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior. And it was to that Lord, that God, that promise, that centerpiece of our faith that we prayed together. Because this little girl asked us to. And the goodness of God was manifested in a miracle. This guy didn't go to church. He didn't like church. He didn't like preachers. Are you listening to me, church? <laughs> this is about Jesus and his people. This is not about Jesus and his church. Jesus and his church, we're, we're a combination. We're supposed to be the testimony. We're supposed to be the evidence of the resurrection. Our life is supposed to be the written word lived out in faith. We're supposed to be the folks who live the resurrection life. That's exactly who we are. But if you're talking about God's people... You're talking about the most righteous person, the most humble person, the grouchiest person, the meanest person. You're talking about the man who doesn't like preachers and doesn't like church and doesn't think that, that he might ever have a place within the kingdom that people so often talk about and sing about and preach about. Oh, he's in church now. He's a believer now. Because just as it is with nearly every Christian I've ever met, and certainly the ones I'm closest to that I can have the best conversation with, the most private, personal conversation about their faith, it takes something special from God for each of us to come to faith. That might happen when we're children. That might happen when we're teenagers. It might happen when we're 60 years old. But it takes a special movement of God's grace a special sound of his voice, a special truth of his presence. And whatever that's needed to be, it seems that God is not in the least bit stingy when it comes to blessing. Now, I realize that this is Bible study, and I miss the Bible studies we have at the church because we eat and we talk and we visit and we gossip and we joke and have fun. And finally, Frida will make everybody sit down and we have about 15 minutes of Bible study. But, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm sorry, right now my beloved wife was crawling over the heater to go to the next room for what I cannot imagine. And I thought, Lord Jesus, please don't let her fall and get killed. And I did mean that. Now, I was praying for that. Anyway, so this fella brought by a little girl who loved him to Jesus, the Son of God, did not walk away empty. Lord, God, have mercy on our unbelief. Lord, have mercy on our lack of faith. So, when I tell you about this friend of mine who wants me to pray for Terry Woodruff, I want you to join with me tonight when you say your prayers for Terry Woodruff, who's battling cancer. Oh, I know we can't cure cancer. I can't even fly a jet plane. I've never landed on the moon. I can't paint. I can't play the piano. In fact, there's not a whole lot I can do. But I know someone who can. I want you to pray for Terry Woodruff and his family and his friends. <clears throat> I want you to pray 
for God to put his healing touch on Terry. I want you to pray for God to work some sort of miracle that will honor the name of Christ and bless the spirit and the faith of Terry Woodruff. I want you to astound the doctors. I want you to pray for God to astound the doctors. Because when it comes to prayer and someone you love, let me tell you something. You don't need to worry about being sophisticated because you want to be busy supplicating. Also, remember the family of Miss Helen Hughes who lovingly surrounded her with their presence throughout her long illness and She's passed from death to life in Christ and, and her place is secure with God. Her faith in him has made wonderful a life that was lived with great zest and absolutely fascinating wit, humor, charm, and goodness. Pray for Miss, Fam Miss Helen's family. The services will be sometime later in October at her birthday. They're going to have a little celebration of her life and a thanksgiving to God for that life and have an apple butter stirring. And if I'm here, I'm going. I want you to remember all the people that you have in your heart when we pray tonight, when it's time for bed. You can get down on your knees if you want to and pray by your bedside or sit in your chair and pray in the chair. Or lie down and pray yourself to sleep. By the way, when you get insomnia, trust me, talk to God. You get so scared because you start being so honest with God that you say, I better lay down now, Lord, we'll talk later. Pray for those people you love tonight. Also, I want to say something to you before we read the rest of chapter 8 because uh, I, I, I have to confess to you that if you, want, if you want to teach a class on Mark's gospel, that's as easy as falling off a log. It's a succinct little 16 chapter book. It's linear in its timeline and movement. It's, it's, it's the kind of text and the kind of message in Mark that absolutely scares the devil to death because Mark never gives the devil any quarter. <clears throat> that was the first gospel, by the way. And Mark just absolutely doesn't give any quarter to the devil or to fear or to sin or to condemnation. Everything is forthright, simply written, easy Greek to translate powerful. You know, chapter 1, verse 1, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. That doesn't even give the devil time to get his uh, defenses up. You're already standing at the river's edge. It's already too late for the devil to even get a foothold. That's Mark. I love to teach Mark, but I'd rather preach it than teach it. And then there's Matthew, who spends a lot of time saying, don't forget where Jesus came from, how Jesus was established, and to whom Jesus was first promised. That's right. Law, don't you hate it? Jesus was a Jew. Isn't that awful? And he loved them, really loved them. And Matthew goes out of his way to say, here's another little tidbit of information, another little promise from a prophet that testifies to the truth of Jesus as Messiah. Matthew is as faithful to Judaism in his gospel writing as he was unfaithful when he was a tax collector. Matthew's easy to preach. Matthew's pretty easy to teach. And then there's Luke. Luke's a piece of cake. Luke says, if they're poor, go help them. If they're hungry, go feed them. If they're scared, go comfort them. If they're naked, go clothe them. If they're in doubt, convince them with your love. Love Jesus by loving others. Don't ignore anyone who suffers. Luke's probably the one, you know, who's a doctor, 
who knew the most about how prayer is really efficacious, how it works. Because any doctor will tell you, if they have any salt, that there's only so far a doctor can take you. And then, of course, there's the hand of God and the voice of Christ and the power of his love and the power of his resurrection and the healing power of his presence and the certainty of his purpose in your soul and in your body and in your life. Yeah, it looks pretty easy to teach. But John's gospel is a love story. Starts out beautifully. Beautiful. The most lovely prologue of anything ever written in the history of the world. John 1, 1 through 18. The most lovely, magnificent, perfect prologue in the history of the world. And then there's not only that, but there's there's this, this amazing, amazing victory story that starts out with with Jesus and a few of his disciples going to a wedding, followed by Nicodemus, a, a very wise and, and learned Pharisee whose heart was as empty as a pumpkin, who was searching all his life for meaning and truth and grounding and certainty and purpose with God. And so one night he snuck off and no one was looking to whisper a few questions to Jesus and boy, did he get his ears full. Love story. John's a love story. The woman at the well. The meanest, most despised person in the worst town of all Samaria. <coughs> there she is, sitting beside Jesus at a well when she had no business being near a rabbi because she's a Samaritan. And Jesus had no business doing that because he was a rabbi and they should never be alone with a woman. It's a rule. And all the time in the conversation, he was preparing to tell of all people this undeserving woman who had kissed a boy, maybe kissed more than one boy, that he was the Messiah and the Savior and her God. John's a love story right up through up until chapter 6. And there we have the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus has a big fellowship meal, actually a homecoming picnic for those people who were from Tiberias and those people who were from Capernaum. And because they were all friends of Jesus, they had to try to be polite and nice to each other, although they would never speak to each other on any given day, or at least not up until that point. It's a love story. And then in chapter 6, Jesus begins to talk to them about the real bread and about, about, uh, about what it is to feed on his body and blood, to have faith to, to, to absorb into themselves the very essence of all that Jesus was from his prayer life and his teaching and his love and his healing to the very essence of what it meant to be touched by Christ, what it meant to be loved by Christ, what it meant to be forgiven by Christ, and what happens? A lot of the people decide to go their way because it's too much too soon for them. <coughs> They're his people. Jesus is the bread of life. And in chapter 7, Jesus is the water that comes down from heaven. The water he talked to the woman at the well about. The water that once you taste it, you'll never be thirsty again. And, and it wasn't well received by everyone. And the disciples who were perplexed about the, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood in chapter 6, they were astounded by this. Jesus is the water that comes down from heaven. Jesus is the unique nature of God's purpose in his promise of the Messiah. Jesus is absolutely perfect. This love story is beginning to turn sour because the, 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 the limits of human faith and reason the limits of human trust and understanding can only go so far. John wants those people who are learning this gospel in 92 AD and every year thereafter, he wants them to understand that it's Jesus who has to come to us to fulfill the goodness of the promise. We can't earn it. We can't learn it. We can't fake it. We can't take it. 
we have to receive it. From the goodness of a spirit that strives with patience and urges us with the kindness of every Christian we've ever known and speaks to our heart when we're most afraid and convinces us of grace even while convicting us of sin. This story is about the first folks who couldn't understand the fullness of Jesus' purpose, and they certainly didn't expect anything like Calvary and the cross. And in John chapter 8, we find the Pharisees finally get the nerve to just come and argue with him, to call him names and say he's not really a Jew, and, and that he's not really even a person who, who could be a good rabbi. Certainly he's not the Messiah. He wasn't born in Bethlehem because, after all, though he was born in Bethlehem, he came from Nazareth when he was preacher. Chapter 8 is where things begin to take their turn, and we begin to see the shadow of a cross that only Christ could carry, and a grace that only Christ could dispense, and an atoning sacrifice that only Christ could bring to the altar. John says, this is the hard truth. This is not a secret society, not a secret religion. This is not mysticism. This is not Zoroastrianism. This is not your standard, traditional, legendary pantheon of Roman or Greek gods. This is the story of a God of purpose who fulfilled every drop of it by promising the Son and gate giving it, and a Son whose obedient love to the Father brought him right into the middle of human existence. Sin, sickness, doubt, fear, <clears throat> and even disbelief. He also came to the very middle of what it means to be a person who thinks they're smart and they're not. Because we may know a thing or two, and it's good to have knowledge. And we might even be wise, some of us anyway. But when it comes to understanding and seeing, and then believing, and then believing more, and then seeing more. When it comes to that, that point where the crisis in your life is, is surrendered to the hope in your heart and the love that you feel in the presence of Christ, that you realize this is something Christ has to do for us. And he does, sometimes he does it just, just like that, overnight, just boom, there it is. And some of us, he walks gently because we have to be taught slowly. But it's Christ who comes, even when he's rejected. So here we are at the conclusion of chapter 8, and the Pharisees have been as hard as they can be on him. I want us to look at a couple of pieces of scripture at the end of this, because this came to me today. And I really, really loved it because it came from somewhere way outside myself. It sort of just came to me like a sunrise. <coughs> the surprise of an empty tomb or, you know, the sound of a trumpet. We'll get to that in a minute. Just start with me at verse 31 and we'll just make our way through this last part of John chapter 8. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And these who believed in him answered and said, we're the descendants of Abraham and have never been servants to anyone. What do you mean by saying you'll be made free? In other words, they didn't understand. That's not unusual for us. And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin becomes a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in a household. The son, instead, has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. I know that you're descendants of Abraham, yet you look for an opportunity to kill me. And this he says to some who are followers who profess to love him. You look for an opportunity to kill me because there's no place in you for my word. I declare what I have seen in the Father's presence. As for you, you should do what you have heard from the Father. In other words, he's giving you a blueprint, a blueprint for salvation and power and glory and freedom. But like us, 
it's hard for them to understand. So they answered Jesus and said, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would not be doing what you're doing now, but you'd be doing what Abraham did. But now you're trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You're indeed doing what your father does. And they said to him, we're not illegitimate children. We have one father, God himself. Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now I'm here. So if you ever feel bad about yourself for having been an unfaithful teenager when it comes to church and God, don't worry about it. If, if you've ever done something in your life when you were in your 20s that you hope nobody ever finds out about, don't worry about it. God already knew and God knows. Doesn't matter. If you've ever had a point in time when you just couldn't possibly grasp the depth and the breadth and the height of this kind of mercy and goodness, this kind of purpose for your eternal soul, join the club. Because all Christians have had that moment. If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and now I'm here. See, you have to be a resurrection Christian. You really do. It's not enough to sit there and say, well, he was a good teacher and was misunderstood and well, this and well, that. No, no, well, nothing. No, this is about a powerful and loving God whose patience endured even the most harsh scrutiny and the hardest turndowns and didn't mind a bit to see people turn their back on him because he was not going to turn his back on them. And that's what John is leading you to. This book of signs speaks of a merciful, loving God who can tell the truth in a healing or in a miracle or in a conversation or even in a controversy because he came for us. I did not come on my own, Jesus said, but the Father sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot accept my word. You're from your father, the devil, and you choose to do your father's desires. <clears throat> I bet this really made them mad. And the truth is, if you're in the Judeo-Christian tradition, you understand that there's a devil who's out to break and sever forever the relationship we have with God and the relationship God has with us. And Jesus said, you're on the wrong side. You're coming at it from a wrong angle. The devil was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Jesus wants to draw a distinction here. There's human free will and wisdom and learning and capacity and capability and talent and, and creativity and imagination. There's even the capacity once in a while to love someone. And then on one side, there is a, 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 a devil who's, who's so at enmity with God that he seeks to hurt us because God loves us so much. He wants to get even with God, and he can't do it by overcoming the angels and archangels in heaven. So he's been given permission to come here and fight it out with us until Christ brings all things into his feet. And Jesus wants to make the distinction clear. You can choose hatred, vengeance. <coughs> you can doubt as if it's your own religious faith. That There are a lot of people. I, I've known a couple of atheists who are the most devout believers in atheism. You know, when I was younger, I, I used to do like the church lady on Saturday Night Live and pray against them, but I've learned better since. Jesus said, over here, this, 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 this agent of, of enmity with God seeks to do nothing but to throw you off your game, to derail your hopes and dreams, to shatter your place with your family, to wreck your heart and take your joy and steal your very soul. Jesus said, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. 
You don't believe me because it's hard to believe and it's easy to doubt. If I tell you the truth, why would you not believe me? Because there's only one way to follow Jesus. He isn't going to give you the secret code. If there is one, he keeps it hidden. He wants you to faith your way into his presence. He wants you to trust your way <coughs> because he is the opposite of the devil. John says there's evil and there's righteousness. The evil is contra to God. The righteousness is of God. So here we stand in the middle. Do you want to be thankful, forgiving, patient, loving, kind? Do you want to be able to express love and show mercy and even practice forgiveness? This is where John is leading you. And it's going to be a hard road from here on out. And this too, this teaching is a sign. The sign of chapter 8 is, you've got to trust me. Follow me. And believe me, because I won't lie to you. So remember that whoever is from God hears the words of God. And the reason you can't hear him is that you're not coming from God. You're not of God. You're you're living your life, maybe not wanting to choose the devil or God, either one. You just want to be your own person. Well, that doesn't work out. Well, it maybe does when you're a teenager. Not often, but I can see how you'd be persuaded. It's when you realize that you can't make this journey by yourself. So the Jews answered, and they asked this question. We think that it's not right to <clears throat> what you say. And we ask, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? Okay, there's the limit of human reason, the limit of human understanding. John has brought us to the limits of ourself in chapter 8. And this is the turning point in this, in this gospel. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. So truly I tell you, whoever keeps my word will never see death. In the middle of such controversy and harsh words and hateful talk, if you believe in me, you'll never see death. The Jews then said, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. And yet you say, Whoever keeps my word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? The prophets also who died? Who do you claim to be? Because this business about a promised Messiah was an old story from a bunch of old prophets who were carrying a whispered promise that God had given to Adam and Eve and restored and renewed again in Abraham and even spoke through Nathan to David the king. But this is just an old myth. Who do you claim to be? And even in that sarcastic question, you know what I see? A hungry soul saying, is it possible? Is there a God who loves that much? Is there truly a Messiah? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me. He of whom you say he is our God, though you do not know him. But I know him. If I would say that I do not know him, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, how did Abraham see it? And how was he so glad? Oh, that's right. Turns out the children of God are the children of God. And there's a way of salvation God has established that is in God's purpose. Lord, when I was little, Aunt Bell would fuss with Uncle Harry about which denomination was right, the Christian church or the Methodist church. And Uncle Harry, who'd been a Methodist, fell in love with Aunt Myrtle, who was from East Tennessee, and she was in the Christian church, and he joined the Christian church. And you'd have thought that he'd have gone into sin. You'd have thought that he was running a, a liquor bar in the middle of town. 
Uncle Harry was as good a man as I ever knew in my whole life. You see, the thing is, what happens is, we're the children of God, called to his purpose, and in accordance with his purpose, called to blessing and forgiveness and salvation. It used to trouble me to death when they'd meet at the post office and fuss and quarrel about church. I think Bill liked it. She professed to be sanctified because she was, and she was as close to sanctified as I ever saw any Methodist. But she was hard on her brother. <laughs> Your ancestor Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. This eternal life thing has been in a purpose of God since creation began. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? I would probably say yes to that if I were answering the question for Jesus. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, and Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Now, I really had a hard time trying to figure out how to approach this and present this because it was so hard, so acerbic. You don't see this in the lectionary very often. Why? Because it's too hard. And preachers don't like stuff that's hard. They like stuff that's easy. They like stuff that they can talk about in such a way that all the old women in the church love them and and all the old men can tolerate them, and all the children are fascinated by a good story. This is not one you're going to hear very often in church. People were mean to Jesus, didn't believe him, couldn't, didn't have the capacity. And it's to these very people that Jesus has come. And even in their rejection, and when they call for his crucifixion, <coughs> he's there for them. So I want to read two little pieces of scripture you're familiar with, and then we'll have a prayer. Let this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. This is Paul to the Philippian church. Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited or grasped, but he emptied himself, took on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he owned himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you know that that's called the Christ hymn? that that's the oldest written evidence of a hymn of the church. We have a song in the Methodist hymnal that speaks of this. All praise to thee, for thou, O King divine, didst yield the glory that of right was thine, that in our darkened hearts thy grace and love might shine. Alleluia, alleluia. You know, there's another way to put it, on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross. Well, just so you'll know that what Paul promised to take place will take place, John had a vision, several indeed, in Revelation. Now, I know Revelation is actually just this, the little secret code that we can study, and if we find out when the rapture is, then we get to go to heaven, and everybody else has to go to Johnson City and find a rabbi. You know that's not true. Revelation is about a victory of the church over all the tribulations in the world. A victory won by Christ and made sure in his return and made glorious in his reconciliation of us forever. In this little vision in chapter 5, beginning with verse 11, John, in, among the other visions, sees a crowd of people and angels dressed in white, filled with joy, singing a song. 
He said, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne of God and the living creatures and the elders, and they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And they were singing with a full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Apparently, this thing called salvation, this Messiah who came to fulfill God's will, this obedient love of Christ for the Father, and this passionate love of Christ for humanity, seems to be the most important thing in the entire cosmos. Now, the early church knew that. It's time for us to, to pick up ourselves off the floor and believe it with them. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing this song. To the one seated on the throne, unto the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four creatures living around God said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. I know that if I had to face death tonight, I'd be scared. I'm pretty sure I would be. <clears throat> and I know and believe and trust and hope and have faith in the promise that my salvation is secure through Christ's blood that was shed on Calvary. And I've besought him to give that blood to me, to pour it over me, to overshadow me with it. I've asked for forgiving grace. I've asked for the Lord to, to be my Savior and forgive me of my sins and be my Lord. And yet still, I make mistakes and I doubt and I just, and you know, I, I'm, I'm just the person who needs grace every day. Sort of like, I need thee every hour. That's a good song. And when I'm scared to death, and I'm often scared, I think about those people in heaven singing. You know, those angels and elders and seraphims and cherubims and all that. And that crowd, that rabble, thousands and thousands and myriads of myriads who've lived and died in the goodness and the mercy of a God whose purpose is complete and fulfilled and established and won and wrought and put forward forever and ever through Christ for his people. We are the resurrection people. We live the resurrection life. Father, we ask your blessing on us today. For though we don't deserve it, we have received this deserving love of Christ. And though we can't possibly fulfill ourselves in seeing it all at once, or understanding it completely, Christ's patience for us is sufficient on our journey as our eyes are opened and our hearts are burning with the truth of his teaching. And the comfort and the sweetness of his presence and the relief of his forgiving love and the hope of his promise for eternity. Lord God, as we study John, and we make our journey through this book of signs and study yet again the passion of John's love for Jesus and, and the passion of John's desire to convince the church of the one true Lord. Let it be our passion too. Lord, for Terry Woodruff, we come to you as brothers and sisters to ask your blessing on the doctors and nurses in his care and, 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 and let them care for Terry as a sign of your grace and goodness. But let your healing hand go forth, if it's in thy precious will, and conquer that which is impossible to be conquered, cancer, and bless him, Lord. <coughs> and from this time until that time, until your time comes for him and for us, we pray that you would overshadow him with your mercy and grace and confidence and peace. And in your blessed way and in your blessed time to be glorified in your love, heal him and us. For all those who have lived and died in the tragedy of the coronavirus, 
all over the world. And for we who in America are so narrow-minded and blindsided that we'll stand in the middle of a great tragedy like this one and point fingers at each other with blame. Let your church shine, O God, through the kindness of nurses and the tirelessness of doctors and nurses in hospitals and the firemen and the policemen who go to work every day and the ambulance drivers and the folks who put up the food on the shelves and the people who pack and stack and ship the food from the farm to the market and for all those people who have to get up and be a part of the world even in the midst of such disastrous danger bless them lord bless them and for those who have died and for we who are yet alive let the same truth be in us all that we who are your children claim your redeeming grace in jesus yes lord there are those who would spend too much energy and too much gas to say, well, there's probably somebody that didn't accept him. I'm putting my trust in you for my salvation, and I put my trust in you for the salvation of your world. And I want the church to be the testimony for you that the world can see and believe through our love. And in our faith, they may recognize Jesus. Renew that then in us, we pray. In the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.